Thank you, Judge Sima and Dean Scottford for those lovely introductions. Um, you do almost want to say it in inaugural, let's just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> but no, there, there is, there is uh, more. And let me say how lovely it is to see all of you and to have all of you in one room, well, most of you in one room. Um, it's, it's overwhelming in a really, in a really, uh, in a really good way, but it is overwhelming. Um, I think I will start with a confession. I, I found it very difficult to put pen to paper for the purposes of writing this lecture. And that is not only because during parts of when I was trying to write the lecture, there was a political car crash in this country that it was unnervingly difficult to look away from. Um, rather, it's because thinking constructively about international law, and international law which regulates violence in particular, given the state of the world beyond our troubled borders, feels a little bit like preaching to the choir, uh, with seemingly no effect on those who don't care to sing. And there are some serious maniacs out there who don't care to sing. Um, given my distant relation to the Von Trapps, I find this particularly vexing. Um, <laughs> over the last decades, the international law euphoria of the 90s, which is when I started to study international law, has waned. Um, that euphoria presented as this inevitable or at least unstoppable story of humanization and humanitarian progress within the international legal order. Today, it might feel a little more like the end of history, but in a different form than we may have hoped. Uh, the nationalism, populism, scapegoatism, is that a word? Okay. Scapegoatism. Um, the self-serving collective failure to cooperate in tackling collective threats. These are all pushing really hard against the 20th century promise of a better world um, forged out of global conflicts. But a looming inaugural lecture has a way of focusing the mind <laughs> and forcing the putting of pen to paper. And it's precisely in times like these that we need to recommit to core values and if we can to reimagine the possibilities. And so the subject um, of this lecture, violence in and of international law, in the next 40 or so minutes, I'll explore a number of regimes which regulate violence in international law precisely with that aim in mind, focusing on the core um, value of equal respect for human life. And here, before I continue, um, I do have to follow my confession with an apology. Uh, I'm Canadian, so I have to apologize for something at some <laughs> point. And, and the apology is this. Uh, the subject matter of this lecture is not easy or breezy stuff. I mean, no past inaugurals have been easy or breezy. Uh, they've been brilliant. But um, for this inaugural, it won't really be possible to follow the tried, tested, and true formula passed on from inauguree to inauguree. The, um, the square bracket, insert marvelously clever and funny joke here every five or so minutes. Uh, not least because you would all think that I'm a raving sociopath. <laughs> um, so we may well need that glass of something at the end of my inauguration, uh, sorry. And finally, before I jump into, well, the law, uh, I do want to provide some personal context for uh, the subject of this lecture. Um, when people ask me what my specialism in international law is, I uh, often reply something like violence in international law broadly defined. Um, and so it is, terrorism, the law on the use of force or the use ad bellum, international humanitarian law, IHL, human rights in the security context, and the state responsibility and treaty law frameworks which underpin and to a certain extent shape these specialist bodies of law. And it sometimes feels rather strange, to me at least, that the academic gaze of a person whose formative years were filled with love, peace, and lots of maple syrup um, should fall on these subjects. <clears throat> And my focus on the way in which the international rules-based order uh, responds to and regulates and constrains violence is almost certainly down to one day in my life. On September 11th, 2001, which was so long ago and yesterday at the same time, uh, I watched Flight 175 fly into the South Tower of the World Trade Center from my window 
in New York City. Uh, I was close enough to Ground Zero to see what I knew to be desperate people fleeing the flames jump from both towers. Uh, my beautiful mama, who was in constant phone contact with me on that day, uh, she tried to tell me that I was seeing paper flying out of the shattered windows, that I wasn't wearing my glasses. She was right. I can, I can never find my glasses. Um, anyway, I did let her think that her version of things was convincing. And at 9.59 a.m., I watched the South Tower, and then half an hour later, the North Tower collapse into an unimaginable graveyard of twisted steel and a beton, um, cement, concrete. Okay. Um, that evening, I joined millions of New Yorkers in vigil, sharing our collective grief and acknowledging uh, a debt to our first responders that we could never, ever repay. And the next morning, I felt a renewed sense of purpose, one which had been drained out of me by the pint uh, from the daily grind of m and work, uh, which I'm very far from now, um, and requested LM prospectuses from a handful of universities. And so began my academic life. Fast forward to the beginning of my thinking for this inaugural lecture, which coincided with the US and UK withdrawal from Afghanistan. So the journey from wide-eyed graduate student through to my promotion to professor was bookended by the 9-11 terrorist attacks and coalition operation, uh, operations in Afghanistan, which responded to them, and the chaotic withdrawal which shamed us all with uh, beach vacations and pets getting in the way of human compassion and honor. And I say that without intending to throw any shade on the serving men and women who uh, carried out that evacuation under extraordinary pressure. And these bookends have evidently shaped um, my academic focus and the lenses through which I engage with the violence in and of international law. So let me set out the problématique, what it is that I'm worried about, account taken of this context that I've just given you, that calls for the response of this lecture. Given the perspective with which I uh, began my academic career, my early focus was on the ways in which international law suppresses violence, including, of course, terrorism. In particular, I explored the legal structures which shape and to a more or less extent constrain uh, a state's defense of those who depend on its protection against violence. But with the passage of time, and most particularly the evolving practice of states since 9-11, I'm of course troubled by the uneven divvying up of the costs and benefits of that suppression, defense, and protection. And I'm not here uh, addressing devastating cases like the um, war of aggression being perpetrated by Russia against Ukraine, uh, where one state is defending itself against an aggressor within its own territory. Um, what we see daily in the news, uh, the catastrophic effects of such a conflict, particularly where one state is acting in flagrant breach of foundational norms of international law, it is, in legal terms, a relatively straightforward case. Um, I'm instead addressing extraterritorial wars of self-defense, most particularly, but not uniquely, where defensive force is necessary in response to armed attacks in one state launched by non-state actors acting from a foreign host state's territory. And the defensive force is by the victim state in that host state's territory. Part of what I have in mind in thinking about violence in international law is how we speak of the international community as a whole, its interests, its core values, including equal respect for human life. And one of our very nearly completed doctoral researchers, Luis Faveros, has done a marvelous archaeological dig on the le legal infrastructure of this international community uh, as a whole, which is such an important feature of the modern international law landscape. But it does have to be said that our international community isn't always quite a whole. It's fragmented, it's organized into sovereign territorial parcels, and a state's primary obligations are owed to those subject to its jurisdiction. The principal interests which states serve are of those who inhabit the territory in which inheres its sovereign equality. In some cases, the interest of the whole and the interest of the parcel align, um, or at least should be seen to align. 
as is obviously the case in respect of the need to cooperate to protect this uh, unbelievably beautiful planet on which we depend and from which we take so much. Uh, and there's some really wonderful work being done here at UCL Laws by our doctoral researcher Aref Shams on what that obligation to cooperate um, does or could look like. But in other cases, and most obviously in the legal terrain um, that my research occupies, the interest of the parcel and the interest of the whole don't always align. I have here in mind two international legal regimes which suppress, regulate, and constrain violence. The use ad bellum and the right to use force in self-defense in particular, and international humanitarian law, IHL, which is the body of law that governs the conduct of hostilities during an armed conflict. Within these regimes, in respect of extraterritorial wars of self-defense, the price to be paid for the protection of life in one parcel is charged to the inhabitants of another parcel. And the question I'm here asking is whether and how these regimes account for the core human rights value of equal respect for life. So let's start by uh, signposting some broader systemic questions before diving into the details and then coming back to the systemic questions at the end. There's, a, there's an increasingly complicated web of legal regimes which might apply to the self-defense context I am addressing tonight. Um, some of which, there's some really interesting work again being done here at UCL Laws, including by our uh, doctoral researcher Nahida Basri on data protection in conflict situations, which is so interesting. And it might be a life's work to try and map how all these bodies of law work together or indeed against each other in protecting fundamental rights in conflict situations. But as I've said, my focus is on the two bodies of law which spring to mind most immediately in the context of wars of self-defense, the law and on the use of force, and IHL, both considered with fundamental human rights in mind. And there's a tension between the core value and universalism of human rights, in particular that all lives are valued equally, and the law on the use of force in IHL, under which the lives of members of one community can be sacrificed uh, to protect the lives of those in another. First, let's think about the ethos of these bodies of law. Under human rights law, a state owes respect for human rights obligations individually to those subject to its jurisdiction, which has been defined broadly in terms of exercisable control. And until recently, or relatively recently, in the development of human rights law, Jurisdiction is the trigger for human rights obligations, and a state's own territory were more or less treated as synonymous. As a result, where human rights had to be balanced against uh, each other, the community which benefited from human rights protection was also the community which paid the human rights costs for that protection. Sometimes individual freedoms are traded for collective security, but the costs and benefits are shared as part of a broader single social contract. In respect of the right to life as it applies within a state's own territory, a life valued entirely for its own sake can only be lawfully taken in very limited circumstances, in broad terms principally to protect the lives and security of others. And the cost of that protection is paid by the very source of the threat to life and security. Human rights law doesn't really contemplate a state lawfully taking a life merely because that person happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Each life is protected or sacrificed on its own terms. But with expanding definitions of jurisdiction, in particular the recognition that human rights law applies to extraterritorial armed conflicts, the um, we're all in this together feature of human rights law is put under pressure. Now to be clear, what I'm not saying is that a more expansive definition of jurisdiction is a bad thing. Indeed, quite the opposite. When states engage in activities which affect lives abroad, um, strictly, a strictly territorial approach to human rights law would leave those lives completely out of the human rights narrative. And there's something deeply troubling of that, about that, which courts have quite rightly addressed through uh, the definition and scope of jurisdiction. But a territorial application of human rights law does have a legal coherence to it in the sense that costs and benefits are shared and life is valued and protected for its own sake. When human rights are applied extraterritorially in wars of self-defense, their individual rights and freedoms 
are traded for our collective security. And yet equal respect for human rights, a respect which is not defined in instrumental terms, remains a cornerstone of the human rights law framework. Whether it can be translated into a context within which we are not all in this together, without doing violence to what equal and non-instrumental respect for life means, is part of what I'm worried about. In respect of the law and the use of force in IHL, us and them is an inherent feature of those regimes. While both require that the lives of those in the territory subject to defensive force be accounted for, the frame of reference is the rights and protection of the community at home. And instrumental loss of life is permissible. It's a permissible feature of the legal calculus of both of these regimes. We'll come back to this. For now, let me sketch the, ses the second systemic point. That is on the interaction of the regimes that I'm here exploring, all of which may apply to the same factual matrix. We'll get into the details in a bit. What I want to note here is that these regimes overlap, but they haven't necessarily been applied cumulatively or holistically. Part of the reason for this is that a lot of the international law toolkit for addressing the coextensive application of legal regimes focuses on norm conflict. It happens at the level of very precise rules, not at regime level. For instance, if we consider the interaction between international humanitarian law, IHL, and human rights law, courts and tribunals have repeatedly rejected what we might refer to as the displacement theory. That's the argument that at the level of applicable regimes, when in walk the laws of war or IHL, out walk human rights. This argument, of course, dovetails with states' resistance to the idea that human rights law applies extraterritorially. But once we move on from the legal battleground of extraterritoriality, the principal question becomes how, not whether, precise rules interact. And accepting that these regimes apply at the same time isn't to ignore the fact that in respect of at least some rules, they pull in entirely opposite directions. To manage norm conflict, courts and treaty monitoring bodies have embraced either that IHL is a lex specialis, which is to say it's the body that applies because it's specially tailored to the armed conflict situation, or that IHL can otherwise be injected into human rights law through systemic interpretation. The effective result of this, though, at the level of specific rules, is actually one of displacement, with specific IHL norms applying instead of specific human rights norms. This is most clearly the case where IHL and human rights law both speak to the same interest or right. As we've seen, and we'll circle back to, both human rights law and IHL have something to say about the circumstances under which a deprivation of life is unlawful. The norm conflict here is that human rights law does not countenance the taking of life to achieve some broader, disconnected, and self-serving purpose. But that's exactly what IHL does. Indeed, the norm conflict is at the heart of the concern around whether equal respect for human life as a core human rights law value can survive first contact with IHL. But once we account for IHL as the lex specialis, or as interpretively relevant, the legal standard which is applied in evaluating the lawfulness of a loss of life is IHL and only IHL. And that's even if the evaluation is carried out within a human rights normative or institutional framework. The point for present purposes is that tools like lex specialis or systemic interpretation in the way that they have been deployed in this legal space are one directional. Given the tensions I've touched on between a human rights and an IHL approach to life, potentially doing violence to core human rights values, we might ask why that needs to be so. Why lex specialis and particularly systemic interpretation aren't more dynamic, reciprocal processes? Human rights law feeding into IHL, which feeds back into human rights law. We'll come back to this at the end. But let's get into some of the details and start with the use ad bellum, the law and the use of force. The UN Charter on the Prohibition of Force in International Relations is absolute, with very limited and expressly stated, expressly stated exceptions. In particular, a UN Security Council authorization to use force or the right to use force in individual or collective self-defense. And while the UN Charter prohibition um, on the use of force is state-centric, the right to use force in self-defense is not expressly so. The common refrain is that the UN Charter isn't a suicide pact. 
The thinking being that a state which is suffering armed attacks at the hands of, for instance, non-state armed groups should not be required by virtue of the historical development of a state-centric international legal order to sit by idly while those who depend on it for protection are killed. Given human rights law, and in particular, the victim state's obligation to diligently protect the lives of those subject to its jurisdiction, it's hard to see how it could be otherwise. The doctrine which some claim, I claim, applies in this context is the unwilling or unable doctrine. It allows for necessary and proportionate defense of force in a host state's territory against non-state actors um, who are launching armed attacks from that host state's territory when the host state is unwilling or unable to prevent its territory from being used to harm other states. Having long said so, I obviously cannot be blind to the very con serious concerns raised by the application in practice of this doctrine. One obvious concern is the extent to which regime change is baked into the cake of the doctrine. A state that's unwilling to prevent its territory from being used as a base of activities for non-state actors will remain a threat, even if the victim state responds to the immediate armed attack at hand. And a state that's unable to prevent, and often for very good reason, won't accept assistance in doing so, also remains a threat. This is a serious concern, not least if we come back to the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the immense human suffering which can follow from military campaigns which don't have a clear and achievable objective or a carefully considered exit strategy. Another obvious concern is the extent to which the doctrine is used to justify wildly disproportionate uses of defensive force with devastating impacts on civilian populations abroad. Proportionality in the use ad bellum context is most often assessed in reliance on a teleological approach. So measuring defensive force as against the purpose of the use of force to halt, repel, or slightly more controversially, prevent an armed attack. Basically, a use of defensive force is um, a use of defensive force in defense of those at home cannot be disproportionate to the purpose which animates it. To the extent that defensive force is precisely targeted at the source of the armed attack, the doctrine is broadly consistent with the human rights law framework. As we've seen, human rights law recognizes the lawfulness of lethal force against the very source of a threat to life in order to protect that life. But the use ad bellum accepts that the lives of innocent civilians may be affected if proportionate to the overall defensive purpose. And one of our recent doctoral um, graduates, Dr. Chris O'Mara, wrote a very compelling analysis of the way in which the use ad bellum proportionality principle operates to constrain force and to protect civilian populations abroad in the host state in the unwilling or unable context. Now, <coughs> Excuse me, I do, a grave, I do him a grave injustice in summarizing his work, uh, but the short answer is that as a matter of practice, it doesn't. That in the unwilling or unable context, and I quote, proportionality is stretched to the very boundaries of meaningful application, end quote. And part of the reason for that is of course bound up with controversies around the temporal scope of the threats that states might respond to a second part of the reason for this is something explored in another recent UCL doctoral graduate's work. Dr. Ed Robinson wrote his PhD on the obligation to address risks of violence within the European human rights framework. And a number of the really important insights of that work apply to the use ad bellum context. In particular, how difficult it is for states to objectively assess risks or threats of violence. When states are contemplating armed attacks against their civilian populations, engaging their obligation to protect those civilian populations, their starting point tends to be to frame the threat or risk of violence in very broad existential terms. The long shadow of the Twin Towers is very obviously relevant here. A state's assessment of threat or risk may also be overbroad or wide of the mark because of the relevant accountability mechanisms that operate to constrain a state's use of force. The government of a defending state is first and foremost, the government of any state is first and foremost, uh, accountable to its domestic electorate. 
not necessarily in this country, but <laughs> else, elsewhere in the world. Um, accountability at the international level for any miscalculation in terms of defensive purpose is significantly weaker than the modern immediacy of uh, domestic opinion polls. The point is that the more broadly defensive purpose is assessed, the more the proportionality calculus can account for heavy civilian casualties in the state in whose territory defensive force is used. And that's, of course, what I'm worried about. The unilateral and self-regarding nature of this calculus has a profound impact on the divvying up and costs of, and benefits of, of protecting life. The benefits, the protection of an extraterritorial use of defensive force are enjoyed by the home team. The costs are paid by the communities who live in and around the source of an armed attack. And the definition of a defensive purpose and the proportionality uh, calculus which hinges on that purpose doesn't really account in law or practice for some broader sense of equivalence one which might be made at the very least more receptive to the human rights ethos of equal and non-instrumental respect for life. So that's the USAID bellum. Let's now turn to IHL. As I've said, this is the body of law that regulates the conduct of hostilities during um, an armed conflict. Now, for those of you whose exposure to IHL is limited to reading the news, you would be forgiven for wondering whether this body of law exists at all. Um, you will read of the rules only insofar as they are breached, sometimes with a kind of shameless inhumanity that I think we all had hoped was consigned to the history books. I think international law professors the world over have a similar response to these sorts of doubts, which is to say that we don't call into question the existence of domestic criminal law because of mad mass murders who get away with it. And that is all that some world leaders are. Happy to talk names over drinks. Um, so let's, let's leave those doubts to one side. And let's, let's accept that IHL is not a body of law that is more honored in the breach than the observance. The volume of day-to-day -day compliance facing practice in armed conflict is considerable, even if it is very obviously not perfect and of course isn't headlining in the 24-hour news cycle. IHL has and will continue to constrain the use of military force in armed conflicts, um, which isn't to say that we shouldn't really worry about how to make after-the-fact accountability enough of a normative pull to constrain the violence of those mad mass murderers and at least make sure that they don't get away with it. But given the concerns I shared with you earlier in respect of the injection of IHL into the human rights realm, and the impact of that on the core human rights value of equal non-instrumental respect for life. My focus here is on the way in which IHL balances its foundational principles. It's a bit of a mantra that IHL balances military necessity and humanity, that the particular rules of IHL weigh both principles, military necessity and humanity, that one principle is not at the expense of the other. We all say so, the military manual say so, the ICRC says so, and the question I have is whether that balance is so self-regarding in favor of the state using military force as to leave the principle of humanity with not very much to do. And if the principle of humanity doesn't have much space, the core human rights value of equal respect for life doesn't have much space either. And we may wonder whether that's something that we can accept given the role that IHL plays in human rights frameworks, account taken of lex specialis, and that human rights law apply extraterritorially to armed conflicts. Part of why I ask this question about the role of the principle of humanity in IHL is because of a different um, interaction than the one I've already addressed between IHL and human rights law. And that's the interaction between the use ad bellum, the law and the use of force in IHL. There's a lot of interactions in international law, or at least the international law that I work in. Um, it's also a mantra, and rightly so, that these bodies of law are independent, that IHL is neutral, blind even, as to the justness of the cause for which an armed conflict is fought, and that it applies equally to all belligerents. This is foundational. The USAID Bellum cause does not, for the most part, affect the extent to which or the way in which IHL rules apply. The devil is, of course, in the phrase, for the most part and I'll come back to this at the end.
The other reason I ask the question about the role of the principle of humanity is that it's, it's often framed as a relational and residual principle, which covers whatever is left over once military necessity has been applied. As a result, the principle of humanity is defined in the negative, and both the principle of humanity and the principle of military necessity do the same job. They prohibit that which is militarily unnecessary, which also ends up being the sum total of what is inhumane. This is a particular interest in reference to the principle of proportionality which operates in the IHL context, which, just to do all of your heads in, is defined differently from the principle of proportionality which operates in the use ad bellum context. International lawyers love using the same word to mean different things in different contexts. Um, it makes teaching this stuff really tricky and, can I say fun also? And it's fun. Um, in the IHL context, proportionality prohibits otherwise lawful attacks against um, military objectives to the extent that the damage to civilian life or property will be excessive in relation to the military advantage anticipated from the attack. It's not unlawful under IHL for there to be civilian loss, but that loss must not be disproportionate to the anticipated military advantage. Proportionality in this context is very much understood, part of the mantra, to be the balance between military necessity and humanity. And the challenges in achieving any such balance are highlighted by a number of debates about the proportionality calculus and how we define the two sides of the equation. One of the debates is the perspective to be adopted in assessing proportionality. Is the perspective that of the attacking commander, or is there an objective standard of reasonableness at play? The more subjective the calculus, the more self-regarding, the more likely assessments of military advantage might be inflated. Other debates um, are around what is and isn't included in military advantage, against which civilian losses can be balanced. Should military advantage be defined narrowly, principally in terms of ground gained and the weakening of military armed forces? Or are there more self-regarding elements of military advantage which increase the tolerance for civilian casualties? For instance, can an attacking state include the protection of its own armed forces in launching the attack uh, to the military advantage variable? And there are temporal questions which affect the proportionality calculus. The military advantage has to be concrete and direct, but it, does it have to be close in time to the attack? Or might it be foreseeable but temporally distant military advantage? The point here is that the heavier the weight of military advantage, either because of a subjective or a broad self-regarding approach, or both, the more civilian casualties and loss it can balance out. So what of this other side of the balance, the protection of civilian populations, the side of the balance which is meant to embody the principle of humanity? One might be forgiven for thinking that 75 years of international human rights law development has some bearing on the development of its IHL principle namesake. And what that bearing is, is reflected in debates about what might be included in the civilian side of the scale. For instance, debates about reverberating harm, whether losses should be limited to immediate death or destruction, or whether um, the balance should account for foreseeable future harm caused by that death and destruction. Now, one might want to adopt a goose gander approach here, to the extent that um, foreseeable military advantages are included on one side, we might want to include foreseeable harm to civilians on the other. In any event, though, a principle of humanity which is informed by a human rights perspective will seek to protect life both concretely and in terms of the conditions necessary for a civilian community to survive, thrive even. This is inherent in obligations like respect and ensure respect in which case reverberating harm seems not only a relevant element, but a necessary one. <laughs> in the same sense, one might ask about environmental damage caused by armed conflict. And Stephen, there may be some work for you to do here on uh, ethical or unethical military lawyers. Um, we're constantly reminded of how intricately our lives and livelihoods are bound up with and sustained by the natural environment. And there is an increasing amount of work, including by the ILC, on the role that the protection of the environment can play in the IHL proportionality calculus. Yeah. 
but we only need to look at the headlines over this COP27 to realize that Mother Nature is not the priority that she needs to be. And that brings us back to where we started, the broader systemic questions, which are raised by a layered or even cascading approach to international law. One in which different regimes, some with radically different starting points, are applicable to the same factual matrix. We can see this issue of, of, of layered or cascading regimes in international law, particularly in respect of the interaction I promised to come back to, that between the USAID Bellum and IHL. There are those who take the position that the law and the use of force ceases to be relevant once there is an armed conflict and once IHL applies. And we have some really exciting doctoral work, um, rightly taking aim at that position, being done by our doctoral researcher, Gal Cohen. Even accepting in principle that the why of war should not expand the how, the why shapes or bleeds into, perhaps quite literally, the definition of military advantage. Um, a state's use ad bellum evaluation of the risks of attacks against its civilian population, which shapes its defensive purpose, will feed into how military advantage is defined for IHL purposes. And the challenges of the unilateral and self-regarding nature of the use ad bellum evaluation, the extent to which it obscures the interest of those communities which pay the price for defensive force, are therefore compounded and amplified. The end result is that the overall proportionality of benefit to harm across communities, not only at the moment that defensive force is adjudged to be necessary, but throughout the harm conflict, is left out of the legal narrative. And it really shouldn't be. It's one thing to say that the UN Charter isn't a suicide pact. It's quite another to say that a universally ratified treaty, which has both universal human rights and collective security at its core, prioritizes one over the other. It's a question of zooming out perspective, both in the sense of a dispassionate and objective evaluation of genuine risks and a long needed understanding that shock and awe abroad doesn't make anyone safer. War takes so much from people, not least their lives. The ethos of human rights law, its universalism and commitment to equal respect for life is so obviously relevant to conflict situations. And we've caught up with this evident truth in more technical legal terms with the acknowledgement that jurisdiction is the trigger for human rights obligations uh, covers extraterritorial armed conflicts. The result of that, however, is that IHL, which doesn't prohibit the taking of life for self-serving ends, has been injected into the human rights framework, applied with the, within the very infrastructure erected to protect life for its own sake. But that shouldn't mean that the chasm between IHL and human rights law is fixed. Lex specialis and systemic interpretation in particular needn't be one directional. It's been accepted that human rights law has an interpretive window through which IHL can shine. But IHL equally has an interpretive window, one which can be illuminated by the human rights ethos of universalism and equal respect for life. And that's of course the principle of humanity. It's a foundational principle. It's part of the IHL mantra, but too often perhaps a somewhat weak foundation or a ritualized mantra. We have the legal tools to ensure that the relationship between human rights and IHL is a more dynamic and reciprocal one. That while IHL hardens human rights law, human rights law softens IHL. Despite our fragmented international community, its sovereign and equal territorial parcels, there is or could be a systemic feedback loop which inches us closer to the core values of the international community as a whole and limits the more devastating elements of us and them. International law contemplates violence. It regulates it. In the best of times, it constrains it. What I've tried to sketch here is how international law might better live up to its core values in doing so and how in the process we can avoid international law doing violence to itself. And now for what Ronan has rightly referred to as the Oscars element of the lecture. Um, I will be brief because I am now standing between you and that glass of something that I promised, making good on my apology. Um, I have been incredibly fortunate in the people I am surrounded by. Um, fortune beyond any which what I could ever possibly deserve, and it's a life's work to pay that forward. Um, some of my greatest fortune was my earliest, 
My mother was strength and grace. My father is my rock. My twin sister, who I knew before her parents did, is brilliant and fierce and generous, and together they're my courage. My younger twin brothers are my best friends. Yes, I did say two sets of twins. My parents were saints. Um, my younger twin brothers, they're, they're support and honest counsel, sometimes brutally honest counsel. I'm looking at the camera. Uh, it's my foundation. And my nieces and nephew are my hope. Finally, on that side of the pond, there's a group of women spread a little bit all over North America whose enduring friendship is my compass. And for those of you who know anything about me, you know I have zero sense of direction. <laughs> so I really, really, I really need them. Um, I've just seen too many people nodding. She really doesn't. <clears throat> when I come across to this side of the pond, to Cambridge, I have to start with my, um, my non-shopping husband, Alex. Um, I don't know. Alex, everything is better. I'm better. Everything is better because of you. And I will just leave it at that. Um, and for my time as an LM through to my fellowship at Newnham College, I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by the most extraordinarily talented people, that they are also lovely. And my family away from home is just further evidence of my incredible fortune. And finally, from Cambridge, it was during my PhD that I clerked for you, Judge Sima, as you noted. And I, I don't want to make you blush. I don't know if you can be made to blush, but I certainly don't want to be made. I don't want to make you blush, but working for a stratospherically excellent human uh, international lawyer who put human rights and compassion at the core of his work, um, it's the model against which I judge myself. And uh, I am so grateful for that time I spent in The Hague because of that. And last but not least, this place. When I arrived at UCL 10 years ago, it was packed to the rafters with superstars. Rafters in serious need of refurbishment, <laughs> but packed to the rafters. And given our growth, that's only more true today, just better rafters. I wish they were more our rafters than they are, but better rafters. Um, the company we keep in this building is just a it's a recipe for extreme humility. Um, but more than that, um, this community just inspires every day with its, its creativity, its compassion, its dedication, its diligence. Um, and I do not take for granted for one minute how fortunate I am that I get to call this house my academic home. And with that, I will just say from the bottom of my heart, thank you all and, I don't know, trap out. <laughs>